the fires die down and the guests are full, the only thing left to do is enjoy the company. Best done with a fresh cigar and a cold drink. This is After the Cook. What's going on, everybody? How are we doing today? My name is Mel Schmiller, Dark Side of the Grill, my co-host, the Barbecue Buddha, my man. How are we doing today? Hey, this is Chris Sussman, otherwise known as the Barbecue Buddha, and you are on After the Cook, a show where we sit down after cooking all day or night sometimes, and we sit down with each other and a guest, and we talk about what's going on after the cook. And I'm good, because we have a smoking guest today, literally and figuratively. Who do we have on the show today? My man, we have Steve Reichlin in the house, the man himself, Project Smoke, all of that crazy stuff. He's going to be live with us today, talking about all of the epic things that he's been doing, and all the stuff that pertains to us, our hobbies, our grilling, and also a whole bunch of stuff that nobody knows about him, because we're getting right deep. I can't wait. I bet you may not even know this about me and Stephen Reichlin. The reason why I'm sitting here today, the whole reason why I am in the field of barbecue at all is because of Stephen Reichlin. Did you know that? I did not know that. That's Jordan? awesome. That's That's my, a, or so this is a big deal for me. I can't wait to do it, man. It's going to be a great time. And on that note, someone's knocking at the door. Ladies and gentlemen, our man, Stephen Reichlin. All right. Well, we are on with Stephen Reichlin himself. Thanks for joining us today. Where are you located? Are you up north or are you down in Miami this time? I am in Miami, Florida, and it is a cold, rainy day here today, which means it's in the low 70s. Yes. Wow. <laughs> which I've covered extensively before, and I'm sure you're a few steps ahead of me. It sounds like you've lived in Florida longer than I have. I've officially become one of those people. I live on the West Coast now in the Tampa area. And I used to make fun of people that would layer up when it was 72 degrees and I was down visiting. Now I've got a hat on and a long sleeve shirt and sweatpants yep, yep. and the whole the thing. The blood does Stop. thin down, doesn't it? This is, you know what? I, I actually thought I would never complain about it either. I'm in central Texas right now and I got a jacket on my legs because it's actually this cold today here too. So what I was saying to Buddha when I left Canada up from Edmonton, Alberta, it was minus 30 Celsius Oof. when I left. So if, if you spit, it freezes by the time it hits the ground. Wow. And then we roll into San Antonio and I'm expecting San Antonio weather. Well, it was, it was a bit chilly, but still it's like summer weather to me. Course, right. So it's, course, yeah. 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 But I'll, I'll tell you what, the last few times I've been down to the States, I was in California maybe a month ago and it was the first time it snowed there for them in quite a while. I would say bad weather is following you. Hey, please go back to Canada. You know that's what that's that's what it <laughs> right. That's yeah. what it seems. Now like. Now we know who to blame. I mean, <laughs> it has been an unusual. This yeah. is my third winter in Florida, and this is the first winter that I've actually been like, it's wintry. I mean, the, in Tampa area, the whole month of January and most of February is like fifty-five degrees and cloudy and gray. It was no fun. Yeah, you know, fun. see. We, we love that down here in Miami because it's so unrelentlessly sunny and warm uh, that right. we get a cold day like this, it, uh, it feels great. How do love you, it. you know, I've tried to do the, the guest research. I mean, we all know you. We all love your work, your TV shows, your books in particular have been very inspiring to me and many others. But what I found interesting, and also it aligns with your personality, is the cerebral nature. Your origin story is in French literature and very heady stuff. How do you go from that into this very blue-collar barbecue world? How, it says here you got into medieval cooking, but even then, I mean, how did you get from Reed College and French literature into Barbecue USA? Well, that's a good question. So uh, I got the degree in French literature and I took a wrong turn, I like to joke. But uh, actually, there is, a, uh, there is a true story. So when I was at Reed, I wrote my thesis uh, on a medieval French poet named Christine de Pison. 
And she was Europe's first feminist, a message which totally eluded me being a clueless 21-year-old when I wrote the thesis. <laughs> but while I was doing my research in the medieval section of the Reed College uh, Library, I came across a book called The Form of Curry. And this was a 14th century English cookbook written in Middle English. So, you know, to the untrained eye, it would be unreadable, basically. But I became right. so fascinated by the idea that people were writing cookbooks 700 years ago. And writing is the operative word there, of course, because back then nobody had a typewriter or printing press. So any cookbook right. that, you know, got circulated had to be copied out by hand. Well, Reed was uh, one of the colleges that uh, submits nominees to a what's called the Thomas J. Watson Foundation. And that is uh, for a, it's a fellowship for a year's independent study abroad after college. Anyway, I had this crazy idea. I'm, I'm going to study medieval cooking in Europe. And I guess the idea was just crazy enough to uh, appeal to the Watson Foundation. And they gave me a grant of 7000 bucks, which back in 1975 was a lot of money, to go and eat and drink my way through Europe while studying history. And uh, I spent 18 months in Europe. I uh, visited all the great libraries in England and France and Germany, reading medieval cookbooks. And a typical medieval recipe began with the words, take Rx, you know, like you see at a, um, at a pharmacy, because back then pharmacy and cooking were sort of two sides of the same coin. And a typical recipe would read, take this, that, and the other, and combine in the customary fashion. Well, I didn't know what the customary fashion was, but I figured maybe I should go to a French cooking school and then I could kind of learn about French cuisine and I could interpolate backwards. So while I was studying manuscripts in the morning, I enrolled in the Cordon Bleu and met a cooking school called La Marine in the afternoons. And uh, I started studying French cuisine and that, you know, I fell in love with it. I've always enjoyed cooking, always enjoyed food, but I think about cooking as a language, right? And in a language, you have two basic elements, right? One is the vocabulary, okay, the words, and the other is the grammar, the rules by which you put those words together. Well, French cuisine, and especially the way that French approach cuisine, is very similar. And that is you've got the vocabulary, which are the ingredients, and then you've got the rules, the grammar putting together, which are techniques which have been developed and honed in France over the last 700 years. So maybe that's the cerebral element that I, uh, I bring to cooking. But anyhow, I went to these two French cooking schools. I came back to the US and I decided I wanted to be a food writer. So I sent off three proposals, three, three stories. Uh, one was to the Washington Post, which was accepted. One was to the Oregonian, which is where I went to school. So, you know, they sort of accepted it. And the third was to our local hippie alternative uh, weekly newspaper. And that wound up turning into a column, and then eventually that was a springboard to reviewing restaurants for Boston Magazine, writing a wine and spirits column for GQ Magazine. Uh, still no cookbooks yet, but that was sort of how I got into writing about food full time. So writing was, that's the tip of the spear to all of this. You, you yeah, writing is really the tip of the spear. Writer. And actually writer is what's on my uh, passport. It's not TV host. It's not you know, barbecue guy, it's not entrepreneur. And I do consider myself a writer. And in fact, even to this day with 32 books to, you know, under my belt, I still feel like if I haven't written something uh, in a day, I don't feel like I've earned an honest day's work. Do you have another book in you other than The Hermit of Chappaquiddick? I know that is your first sort of non-food related book. Do you have any of the other stories in you? And can you tell us a little bit about that book? It's, it's very interesting. Sure. So uh, I always wanted to be a novelist, you know, not a cookbook author. But uh, again, that crazy wrong turn I took in Paris that, uh, you know, led me into food writing. Uh, and uh, this was about, so the book Hermit of Chappaquiddick came out in 2012. So we spend the summers uh, in, on Chappaquiddick Island, which is part of Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. And when we first came there and started building our house, our house was in the middle of the woods, and this idea popped into my head, the Hermit of Chappaquiddick. There's a guy who, due to life's misfortunes, winds up living totally off the grid uh, on Chappaquiddick Island. 
And then there's a woman who's a New York book editor, because this is a world I know very well. And uh, uh, she is on Chappaquiddick, cow sitting for some friends, recovering from a serious illness. And somehow they meet and a romance ensues. I guess that's not giving too much away. I guess that's the kinder, gentler uh, side of my barbecue self. Anyhow, so I had this idea, but uh, I, you know, I kind of was on the back burner for, I don't know, half a dozen years. Then my cookbook editor took a leave of absence, uh, and I started writing a chapter, and then I wrote another chapter and another chapter, and a couple of weeks went by, and I said to my wife, hey, I think I'm going to write a novel. So uh, I wrote it. It was a funny thing. I kind of knew how it would begin. I knew how it would end. I knew who most of the characters would be. What I didn't know was how that would happen. And I would say to that extent, the book sort of wrote itself. I have a couple of other novels that are started. Uh, they're on the back burner. Uh, it actually turns out, uh, you know, everybody says writing your first novel is the hardest. Well, actually, writing your second novel is the hardest. <laughs> because your first one, you think maybe I got lucky and that, you know, that just happened. Uh, I mean, also, I've been, you know, I've been very lucky to my books uh, are in demand. So, you know, do you take the ones that are definite sales that, you know, are going to generate a certain amount of money or do you take something a little bit more speculative like a novel? But I do have uh, I do have a couple more novels on the back burner. Uh, I got another cookbook kind of on the back burner that's about to move to the front burner uh, and a couple of other writing projects. That is awesome. I, I I love to hear that, man. I so I have to I have to jump into this before we lose it. Back to the medieval cooking trip that you did. How did that relate to barbecue today for you? At the time, barbecue really was not part of my thinking. However, in the Middle Ages, if you think about it, there were no gas stoves or grills. There were no electric stoves or electric grills. So pretty much all the cooking was done over live fire. And in fact, uh, there's a a cookbook called the Viandier, uh, which means something like the vic victualler uh, or vittles, you know, the book of vittles, written by a chef named Taillevon, whose name means wind slicer because his knife skills were so awesome. And in that book, he has, you know, he describes a couple of grilled dishes. In fact, one that I resuscitated in my book, How to Grill Vegetables, which, uh, which came out a couple of years ago. And in that book, he describes taking eggs, poking holes in either end, blowing out the eggs, beating them, uh, adding flavorings, stuffing them with a funnel back into the eggs, putting them on a skewer, and uh, grilling them like a kebab. Now, I thought that was just kind of a bit of showmanship and it couldn't possibly work. But when I was writing uh, Barbecue Bible and I was in Thailand and Cambodia, I did indeed see ke kebabs of eggs on a skewer. Uh, the flavorings were different, but that really is a thing in Southeast Asia. Anyhow, to kind of answer your question about barbecue. So I had a mentor, the woman who ran the uh, La Varenne cooking school in Paris. And one day she said to me, you know, Stephen, you'll never earn a living writing, writing cookbooks. So boom, the gauntlet was thrown down. The challenge was thrown <laughs> out. And I decided, OK, I'm going to make a living writing cookbooks. Well, it took my five first books, which really didn't make very much money at all. They they proved my mentor right. You couldn't really make a living writing books. But the sixth book was a book called Miami Spice. I just out, moved down to Miami. And that book did sell over 100,000 copies and, you know, did prove to me that you can indeed make a living writing cookbooks. Well, I mentioned earlier that I was a restaurant critic for Boston Magazine. And during that time, I developed a cholesterol problem. That was before the advent of uh, Lipitor. So I came up with this method for eating food with a lot of flavor, but not much fat to bring my cholesterol problem under control. And that led me to a series of books called High Flavor, Low Fat. A couple of them were my first James Beard Award winners. Looking back on it now, you know, kind of a weird subject. But anyway, if you want the whole truth, that's the truth. Uh, barbecue came to me pretty late. Uh, it was uh, a little over 25 years ago. And it was one of those kind of ideas that pops into your head. I remember where I was sitting, what I was wearing, what the weather was like. And it was like time slowed down. And I heard this voice from one high and it said, follow the fire. 
The idea was that no. grilling is universal, but in every country and culture, people do it differently. So I would set out, I'd travel around the world, I'd document how people grill in different cultures and countries. And that book became the Barbecue Bible. And, you know, it was the right book at the right time. It became an international bestseller. So I was in barbecue, but not quite yet because I thought, you know, this traveling around the world is pretty cool. So I'm going to write a noodle Bible next, and I'll do this same world tour again to write about noodles. But somehow that didn't just didn't come together quite the same way. (laughs) So one night that may or may not have been substance enhanced, I made a list of all the things I could do with barbecue and wanted to do with barbecue. And then it was other books, a TV show, a website, a barbecue school that became Barbecue University, a line of products, et cetera, et cetera. And then I was in barbecue full time and kind of barbecue is where I've been ever since. So if I'm hearing that correctly, there is a chance. And if you believe in the multiverse concept, this is definitely out there in the multiverse that you could have had this whole fame centered around the world of noodles, that none of us barbecue people would ever really know you or just know of you kind of off to the side, but you'd have this whole noodle university, noodle USA, uh, the the noodle brisket Bible. I mean, this whole noodle (laughs) world would be open to you and all of us, but it didn't, and so here we are. It could have been. And, you know, Noodles would have answered. I mean, you probably gathered by now what really juices me about this field. I, I Look, I'm not, you know, I'm not a competition guy. I could never win a Kansas City Royal or a Memphis in May. Here, here. I'm more about the teaching, the explaining. I'm really a frustrated anthropologist. So for me, <laughs> it's the intersection of food and history and culture. That's what I love about barbecue. Now, as it turns out, that noodles have that same quality in a way. You know, there's a great story behind every noodle dish. And the transmission that noodles really come from China to Italy via Marco Polo or were noodles really invented by the ancient Romans. You know, so there's, so, so there's a big story there. For me, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with my books, you know that there's a lot of prose in them. And I always like to joke that I write the books for the stories and people read the books for the recipes. But f- for me, it's very much the backstory is as important as the recipes. No. Well, what, I, what I'm really getting is your passion, maybe in noodles, maybe in barbecue, maybe in French literature, but it's really writing. You love the intersection of learning, observing, experiencing, but being able to, to put that down pen to paper and share those thoughts with the world. That seems to be where I see you perking up the most. Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. It's the explaining, the teaching, the, the, the sort of... I think when I came to barbecue, you know, it was sort of this big incohate mass of regional traditions. You know, um, I did it because this is the way my daddy did it, and his daddy did it. And I don't right. think anybody had ever kind of tried to analytically break down the process. Think Now, wait a minute, so... What are the five methods of live fire cooking? And how does each one work both from a physical sense, from a chemistry sense, from a physics sense? What foods are appropriate to this? Ditto for the flavorings, ditto for the concept of layering layering flavors. I mean, people did it, but I don't think anybody had thought to, to, to sort of break it down into a system. And that's what I tried to do in Barbecue Bible and How to Grill and some of the other early books. And, you know, what I still do today. I'm curious to dig in a little bit more about the cholesterol stuff you talked about earlier. Has that changed now that food science has changed and Lipitor has entered the world? How do you manage your cholesterol now and be in the barbecue world and teach it? And I was going to say, if you if you have any special tips or anything, <laughs> feel free to jump right in there. Because sure. we're all kind of battling the same demons, I'm thinking here. So Okay, well, there's a one, the two wonderful medications. One of them's called Lipitor and another's called Easy to Me Be. And uh, Easy to Me Be, as I understand it, helps Lipitor work better. But that's how I control that situation. But, you know, and this is maybe from my restaurant critic days. I've always been kind of a more of a taster than an eater so you know i just don't eat a huge amount i like to eat many things but you know when i go to a restaurant i mean i'm very happy to order three or four appetizers and not bother with the main course you know i also have a a coterie of young assistants and uh, kids that i 
take with me and sort of I'm happy. When I was writing Planet Barbecue, you know, I'd hire college students to be my guides in the various cities and countries. And then we'd sit down, I'd order everything on the menu. I'd take a taste and write about it and they'd finish it. They thought they had died and gone to heaven. So what I'm hearing is it's a combination of Lipitor and an incredible sense of self-discipline because that's, (laughs) I've got the Lipitor piece down, but it's hard for me when I'm in the middle of a really good dish to mentally be able to stop, even when there's more stuff to eat. Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, also, I think I'm probably a little older than you guys. And, you know, as you get older, you don't eat quite as much. However, that's not to say that that sometimes it's not a struggle when it's really good, you know, uh, discipline goes out the window and you do finish everything. (laughs) Exactly. That's life. So one of my questions that's burning a hole in my pocket right now, uh, Stephen, is in your tours, everywhere you've went, what is your favorite style of grilling and where did it originate from? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. So, I mean, uh, f- first of all, of course, we have to make the distinction between grilling and barbecue. And, you know, barbecue is low and yeah. slow and a lot here, of wood here. smoke and kind of associated with North America and Grilling is hot and fast and associated with the rest of the world. And on one level, that question is like, you know, who's your favorite child? And on any given day, I can answer easily. But taken in the big picture, you know, you love all your children. And I feel that way about barbecue. That being said, personally, I like to eat grilling in the style of Southeast Asia. That is Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia. That, is, that food is very explosively flavored, big flavors, but small portions. And the yep. grilled meats are always paired with a lot of vegetables. Uh, so it's a very healthy way of eating. So oddly, it's back to that high flavor, low fat method that uh, you know I espoused when I was uh, after my restaurant critic days. So if I could only eat one style of grilling for the rest of my life, it would be Southeast Asian. If you made me pick within the, you know, within those countries, that would be a little tougher. But that being said, you know, I mean, how could I ignore Indian tandoori or uh, Argentinian asado or Jamaican jerk, you know? So don't yeah. make me do that, guys. Do, well, yeah. do you have a particular <laughs> South Asian dish, I mean, that comes to mind when you talk about this? I mean, there must be something pop that pops in your mind, like beef sure. skewers, Thai beef skewers. Is there something that you could share with us that's really good? Sure. Well, I mean, satay, which is found throughout Southeast Asia, and those are those little tiny skewers and, you know, infinitely uh, uh, of infinite variety. I think there are several hundred in Indonesia alone. Uh, and those are often served with peanut sauce, which I love. And they're often served, you know, with a cucumber salad or some kind of a, mm. a fiery uh, green papaya or green mango uh, slaw. Uh, that I love. So that's yeah. that's one dish that I would highlight. Um, another dish I would highlight, it's a Vietnamese dish called bo bun. And it's a lemongrass flavored grilled beef that's served with rice noodles and different vegetables. I also feel a little guilty not mentioning uh, Japan because I was born in Japan. And, uh, you know, I've been to Japan to, to battle the Iron Chef and a couple of my books have been tra- translated into Japanese. And I love Japanese grilling. But in Japan, a little bit like Italy, it's they venerate simplicity. And um, so, you know, aside from uh, teriyaki and yakitori, most Japanese grilled food is extremely simple. And there might be a flavorful sauce, but just like. Italy, a few years ago, I did a TV show in Italy. Uh, it's called Stephen Reichland Eats Italy. It was for the Italian Food Network. And we went around Italy. You know, they introduced me to grill masters. And invariably, it was meat, salt, olive oil, fire, maybe squeeze of lemon juice, uh, maybe a little rosemary or a little sage. But if I were to write a cookbook about that, it would be a fairly monodimensional cookbook. I mean, the food was all great, but there were not a lot of layers of complexity. The other piece of this TV show was we rented a villa in Tuscany, and then uh, I did my interpretations of these dishes. So, you know, I was throwing clams and bacon on grilled pizzas, and I was topping bistec a la Fiorentina, the famous Florentine steak, with a pan fry of, uh, of chilies and garlic and parsley or cilantro. And, you know, the crew thought I was crazy, like, what is he doing? You know, this, this, <laughs> he's adding so many flavors and so much stuff to our beautiful, simple food. But yep. that's, you know, that's how I like to eat. 
<laughs> do you have other countries that you're doing a similar style show other than Italy? Well, I did a lot of um, TV work in Montreal. Uh, I did four seasons of a show called Le Maître du Grill, The Grill Master. That was followed by The Indispensable Dishes of The uh, the Grill Master. And I'm hoping, I'm, I'm, I'm working on getting a TV show in France. That would be, that's, that's kind of my, the last big thing on my list that I really want to do. So next month I'm headed over to Paris for the Paris Barbecue Expo. It's a big, you know, all of a sudden in the last two years, the French discovered barbecuing and grilling. And yep. so i um, hoping while I'm there, I'm going to meet with producers and network and uh, be able to pull off a, um, a cooking show in France. If you need a college assistant for that, I could play the role of the college assistant for that trip. Fair, just just fair, throwing my ha- name I mean, in the hat. Or the- you know, it's so <laughs> funny. When I majored in French literature, um, back before people actually worried about how they would make a living with their degree in college. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm sure my dad, my poor dad pulled his hair out. What the hell, the, how the hell are you going to make a living with French literature? But then when I finally did the, the uh, French-Canadian TV show, you know, it became a little bit apparent. Now, you know, if, if the next phase of my life is involved with uh, doing television in France, you know, it just took me uh, a while to get back to it. Well, the first time I went to uh, France with my wife, who speaks a little bit of French, I thought it would be the really cool thing to do is to go to night school and take French lessons. I knew I wouldn't be able to master the language, but I at least wanted to be able to introduce myself and get around. Because, yeah. you know, sure. it, as an American, you hear the French are snobby and may look down upon the American. And I it was a terrible French accent, but I try. Anyway, so I went to night school for like six weeks. I was really proud of myself. I went to every class. I did the homework. I did all the stuff. I went over there to France, and I quickly realized the French could care less that my name was Chris, that I was from America, (laughs) that here's my wife and her name is Debbie. All of these pleasantries that I learned, it it just really fell on deaf ears. What would have been a better use of my time is learning how to order food and wine and and navigate around the city. So, Mm -hmm. je m'appelle Chris, je suis Mm -hmm. American, that does as good as that's about it, and everything else that sort of (laughs) fell on deaf ears. Well, you know, part of that is the fault of the French, uh, because in Italy, you know, I speak rudimentary Italian. If you make an effort, they are so excited and happy. And ditto in uh, Quebec, you know, French speaking parts of Canada. Uh, They're so pleased and honored. But the French, you know, I, I speak very good French, but sometimes when they hear my American accent, they'll switch to terrible English because... They're French, and, you know, nobody right. should speak their language with uh, an American accent. They're getting better. Yeah. They're getting better, I must say. The young, yeah. y- younger people are getting better. So, of it. all your world travels, I know that there's that factoid I read about you. What's the name of the dish? Copa Capec or something like that. You ate. It's the weirdest thing that you've ever eaten. Cocorazzi in, in Greece. Yeah, so, so what, yeah, they, yeah, they give some other weird dish. talk about that, but also talk yeah. about, I'm, I'm sure there have been runner-ups to that. You must have eaten a lot of interesting things along your international travels. <laughs> well, there were. So kokoretsi, what you do is uh, you take a lamb's or sheep's brain, the sweetbreads, the tongue, the lungs, the liver, the spleen, and uh, probably a few other unmentionables I can't remember. You put them on a big spit. And then you wrap the whole shebang in small intestines to hold it together. Okay. And you season it with salt, pepper, and oregano, and you cook it on the rotisserie. So it's sort of like haggis, you know, Scottish haggis on a I was stick. Just gonna say. Yeah. yeah. It actually, I mean, it, surprisingly, you know, it tastes better than it sounds. I, had, I actually did clean my plate. Would I go out of my way to yeah. order it again? I'm not sure, but uh, it's pretty good. In Argentina and um, – South America, they do a lot with lamb entrails too. So they have something called choto, where they take the small intestine and they kind of wrap it up into make it make a little sausage and they grill it and it's really delicious. And as long as you don't ask yourself too much what's the sort of creamy stuff inside the intestines, I guess that's fine. Uh, when I was in Bali, Indonesia, they have a dish called um, babi gurig, a roasted pig. And I went out with a uh, babi gulig. That's it, Bobby Gulick. I went out with a, the grill master early in the morning and um, picked the pig out. And then he, 
kind of laid his hands on it to put it to sleep. It was really quite amazing. And then he handed me the knife and said, here, you do the honors. So I um, stuck the knife in and the pig bled. And then apparently tradition calls for you take the warm pig's blood and you mix it with freshly grated coconut and you eat that. That's kind of a mm. grill master's breakfast in um, Bali. So I ate that. And, you know, it's another one of the thing that it was pretty tasty going down. But um, I don't know if I would eat it again. I'm I'm not sure if that last segment was making people really compelled to listen more, or radio <laughs> knobs have been turning off across the. All right. Well, let's, you know what? You, <laughs> let's, let's let's cut that maybe. And uh, no, but you know, you, you, keep, you keep an open mind, and um, you know, food that's weird to us. I mean, I'm sure in many countries, the idea of eating a pop tart, or uh, we have a lot of really crazy junky food here. And I was going to say, in doing our research, when we heard that that Greek dish, the first thing that popped into my mind was Robbie Burns Day, three yeah. shots of whiskey to clean that out. That was yeah. the, you know what I mean? Pull the sword yeah. out, cut the haggis, and then, yeah. yeah. Yep. So it was pretty cool Pretty cool to hear that, though, to, to see that that's, you know, something that all of us as foodies or whatever, we're all going to come across a dish just like that where it's, you got to knuckle up. So that's that's sweet. I really like to see that. Well, and if you think about it, you know, I mean, today we're 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 living easy, and food is never have never been more available to most people in the world than it is today. But you think about times gone by, you slaughtered that pig or that sheep. You are not going to let one morsel go to waste because you're hungry so much of the time, and meat is scarce and expensive, so it serves. I've done a lot of research on prehistory because that's really when fire was discovered and that cooking was discovered. And the evidence suggests yep. that, you know, when uh, prehistoric hunters brought down large game, first thing they ate were all the innards because they were yep. soft, they were tender, they were uh, rich in fat and nutrients. Yep. And then, the, you know, the so, sort of noble cuts of meat that we think of today were probably eaten. That, that was a secondary byproduct yep. on this. Do you have any dishes that you've created that fall in this category of stuff that Americans or we typically wouldn't see? I know you've eaten it, you've experienced it. Have you been uh, prompted creatively to uh, do something like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I have sweet breads. Okay, that's probably a crossover dish. Sweet bread, it's the thymus gland of a, uh, of a calf. It's a delicacy in France. Uh, where it's not grilled typically, but it's usually braised and then sautéed. It's fabulous. And in Argentina and Uruguay, it's a just cut it open, salt it, and put it on the grill and, and just char it up so it's crusty on the outside and creamy on the inside. That's great. That's a, I think that's probably a good crossover dish. And I actually just saw that, had that at a restaurant on Friday night. So, uh, you know, I think maybe so m maybe people... People might try that. I'm out here with Al Fragoni at Al Fragoni's cabin yeah. on the, the Guadalupe River right now. And we, we every day, almost, we have Moyecas, we have yeah. Morcia, you know, yeah. every day. So it's all, it's all about charring the lemons, simple salt, on the grill, and it's beautiful. And this hey. is, so I just thought I'd tee into that. Say say hi to Al for me. We had Al, you know, we taped, uh, we taped the next show. My new show is called Planet Barbecue. And we oh. taped it. We taped it in San Antonio, and Al was one of our guests, and he was fabulous. And uh, we made, among well, he, other uh, he, things, a he, beef he, pizza. Is he coming on the show? I'd love to say hi to him. Hey. Hey, Al. How are you, man? <laughs> All right. Hey, how are you guys? Good, good, good. to see you. Hey, Al, your segment, too, came out, your segment came out fantastic. In fact, we're going to run the Argentinian show as yes. our first show of, uh, of the series. It was really great. Nice. Awesome. Okay. Yes, we, had, we had fun, right, Stephen? We that did. We had fun. Yeah, it was great. I almost burned the whole set up, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, a couple of fires on the set of a barbecue show, no uh, no calls for alarm. Yeah, true. <laughs> hey, great to see you guys. Hey, Buddha. Take Hello, care, man. Al. Ciao. Thank you, brother. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Yeah, so that, that, was my, that was my segue to Guts was... Al makes me eat a lot of weird stuff, and I absolutely yep. love it. I have yeah. full faith in his culinary. It, it's like artwork, watching this stuff come together. And I, I've had, I brought it to Canada, and I've had camera guys that are looking at me, and they're like, I'm actually going to call my mom after shooting this and tell her what I just ate. And it's super cool. I love yeah. that, because it's, it, they see the beauty and the romance mm -hmm. of cooking it, 
and they put their ego aside and just taste it. And that's when you know you just broke through and that person's going to be on a, a culinary journey for the rest of their life that's different than the nuggets they were on when they got to your house. Yeah, that is a, that's that. a, very well put. And yeah, I'm pretty sure I read an article recently that Led Zeppelin is getting back together and their new album is going to be called Segway to Guts. Fresh <laughs> <off> the <laughs> <pastas> <laughs> right here. We and of course, in Texas, over. the nickname for a beef sausage is a hot gut. So. Hot gut. Yeah, yeah. the hot guts. So yeah. what's next for you, Stephen? Do you, you know, you're multifaceted. Is it the book that's going to pop off next? Do you have a TV show you're promoting? What's, what's on your docket? Well, the most immediate project, you know, you shoot a TV show, which typically takes two and a half weeks. And we did that in San Antonio this year. The new show, as I said, is Planet Barbecue, and it really focuses on uh, international grilling. And so you shoot the show, but then afterward, there's an enormous amount of time that goes into editing the show, recording the voiceovers, uh, recording all the little bits and pieces that turn the raw footage into a final TV show. So I'm working on that. You know, big part of my time goes to that. Uh, I'm working on a couple New York Times stories on grilling, so that takes time. Uh, getting ready for this trip to uh, to Italy and France. I launched a new business last year. It's called Planet Barbecue, a different Planet Barbecue, and that's a mail order uh, barbecue business. The, sort of the theory behind that was people read about my barbecue in my books, they watch it on my TV shows, but they had they don't really get to taste it. So this way they can taste my barbecue, they can order it by mail and taste it. And um, awesome. so that's kind of another project I'm working on. You know, and you're, you're so traveled and you're so connected to the barbecue community. It's hilarious every, every time I'm with someone, one of my friends are like, oh, I was just on a shoot with Steven. And I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. Really? Like, like, and it's nonstop. It's hilarious. I can't wait to see the projects. That's why I'm not digging into names or anything, because yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But I can't wait to see. There's so many things I've seen behind this that are going to come out in places. Yeah. It's wild. Like, you are, you are, like, finally connected to everything out here. I love it. Well, thank you. You know, I've been, um, I've been in the field for quite a bit. And, you know, with, the, with San Antonio, we really tried to get out and, uh, and meet interesting local people who are doing interesting local grilling. So I'm glad you're pals with Al. Uh, we had a Brazilian grill master on. We had uh, a woman named Nicola Black who uh, was born in Jamaica. She did a wonderful version of jerk chicken for us. You know, I always like to say in barbecue, there's no such thing as a stranger, just a, a friend you haven't met yet. And I really think that's true. And I think that it's, yeah, you know, sure, it's competitive sometimes, but I think there's really a, a spirit of uh, friendship and sharing and cooperation. Steve and I met once mm -hmm. at the very beginning of my barbecue career at uh, Oktoberfest in 2018. Okay, so, yeah. yeah. We skipped over something that I've been thinking on since the question or since your answer earlier. So you got into writing. That's your real passion. Or I wouldn't say that's your real passion, but it's a large passion. You love writing. Yeah. That's how you started. Yeah. You wrote all these books. And as you said, you, even at Miami Spice that did the best out of the first several books, it mm -hmm. still didn't seem like that was the one to launch your career and turn you into this person we all know and love today so what was it like before the success came what made you keep going what will give us some inspiration to those of us that i'm releasing my second book it comes out next month april 25th so thank i'm early on in that journey thank you very much so i need words of encouragement because i do what kept you going okay well first of all you write the best book you can Hopefully you are with a good publisher, but I was very lucky in that I, uh, my wife is a publicist and I married her right when I was making that transition from writing books that I liked that nobody read to uh, hooking up with Workman Publishing, writing books that a lot of people wanted to read. And what I learned from Barbara is that in one sense, writing the book is only half the labor, uh, half the task. In fact, I mean, in a way, it's the easier task. And you've got to make sure you sell it, too. For me, that was, a, you know, Workman was the pioneer of the book tour. And typically with my books, I would go on 20, 30 city book tours. And it's a little bit like a political tour. You know, you stop, you do uh, morning radio, you try and do morning television, you do a book signing or a demonstration or an event or public speaking. 
you just try, you just get the word out there. So that is very important. Of course, today that's super easy with social media. We didn't have social media back then, but you know, you can go from, you know, zero to uh, to a million followers if you've got the right message. So that's an important thing. Uh, but you know, uh, passion. If you're excited about it, that certainly makes it uh, a lot easier. But also, not every book is going to be a, a success. And even for me, and I've had several million plus copy bestsellers. You know, I've written some books that haven't uh, that haven't sold that well. That's kind of part of the process too. I guess if you think about it in baseball. And if you're batting 300, that's pretty good, right? That means that 700 of your uh, efforts are going to fail. Or you think about basketball, you know, even LeBron James misses uh, foul shots every once in a while. Right. Yep. What's the so book, by the keep... way? What's the second book? It's the first book, which, thank you, you gave me a book cover endorsement. I appreciate that. was the first, mm -hmm. uh, the four fundamentals of smoking. So basically, like, beginner backyard barbecue people trying to explain to them the concepts of wood and the difference between grilling and smoking mm -hmm. and the temperature zone mm -hmm. and what really is going on with smoke and all that kind of stuff and then some recipes mm -hmm. the second book is a total pandering to my audience it's called the ultimate big green egg cookbook it's a hundred recipes all designed for the big green egg and uh, a little bit of how i do the big green egg set up and manage fires and all that stuff oh, so great. it comes can't, out april 25th yeah Good. So as we are coming to the closing moments of your time, and thank you very much for spending an hour with us today. You are uh, mm -hmm. one of my heroes. I was telling this story at the beginning. I've probably told it to you when I met you in person myself, but how my barbecue journey began. And what I mean by that is, you know, I was your typical weekend griller on a Weber or similar gas grill. Uh, I play music, as you notice in the background, and I was, mm -hmm. this is early on, my kids were really little, and I was going to band practice, and the guy whose house we would practice at was the one last guy of us that wasn't married yet, so of course, we would all congregate at his house, drink beers, watch hockey, all that stuff, and then play some music, and he was your bachelor's bachelor. Well, one day I showed up there early, and he had a Weber kettle grill, he had the coals pushed to one side, and he was cooking a pork tenderloin, and at this part of my life I mean I was you know very a younger man I didn't even know what a pork tenderloin was I didn't know anything I didn't know indirect cooking anything and he was making he was really paying attention to the pork tenderloin and was putting sauce on it it looked great it smelled great and it tasted great but it was so weird because this guy Charlie was a bachelor and you would never think he would pay attention to anything maybe a bologna sandwich that's it so I asked mm. him how did you learn all this stuff? What are you doing? I don't know how to mm -hmm. interpret the mm -hmm. signals and senses that my eyes and ears and, and everything is telling me. And he went into his room and he got Barbecue USA, your book, and he handed it to me. He said, I read this. This is like my go-to book. I'm learning barbecue. You should do that. And that's how, that's how my journey began. I went out and got that a smoker so cool. that weekend and began to use your book to learn all about the craft of barbecue. So thank you. For me, this has been a real pleasure. That is so cool. I think this is the 25th anniversary of Barbecue Bible. And sometimes I kind of have to you know, pinch myself and say it's been 25 years really gone since the, I since that book first came out. But uh, it's been an amazing journey, and um, it's uh, we have I've, I've just met incredible people all over the world, and had incredible experiences. Uh, you know, when I went over to Japan the uh, first time on a book tour, my kids said, "Wait a minute, you're not going to Japan without us." So I wound up taking them uh, when I uh, did a grill session with Howard Stern. Once again, the kids said, wait a minute, you're not going to Howard Stern. Yeah, that's not. Awesome. So uh, <laughs> they call and say, Howard, do you mind if I bring my kids? By the way, he's a, you know, just a very, uh, he's a real gentleman. Not on air, but. Did in, he mind uh, you bringing the kids? No, he couldn't have been more gracious. Couldn't have been more oh, gracious. Oh, cool. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yep. So, so what in our final moments, what are your closing words of wisdom, Mr. Reichlin? Well, let's see. I told you about all the current projects uh, that are um, in course. By the way, if anybody's a Barbecue Bible fan, some, a couple in Spain started something called the Barbecue Bible 500 Club. During their COVID lockdown, uh, they spent the lockdown cooking every recipe in Barbecue Bible. So they have started this club. It's a Facebook club. You can sign up. 
and uh, you start cooking your way through Barbecue Bible. You post pictures. There are prizes at different levels, and that's kind of a fun thing for people to do. And it's attracted people from all over the world because Barbecue Bible, I think it's in 15 or 16 different languages now. Uh, but final words, you know, uh, just just my uh, the, uh, the key to great grilling. It's uh, you've heard me say it a million times. Keep it hot. Keep it clean. Keep it lubricated. Uh, that means, of course, you know, start with a hot fire, clean your grill grate, and uh, keep it well oiled. But they called it paper towel dipped in oil. So. I guess I'll leave you with that. Keep it hot, keep it clean, keep it lubricated. Awesome. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure, boss. I really appreciate you coming on. Just keep keep doing amazing things every single day because you're just touching everybody, and it's wild. Well, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it, and um, thank you for your interest, and take care, guys. Holy cow, that was a great episode. Man, I love that guy. He gets me fired up all the time. He's a poet and he totally knows it. What do you think, Chris? Total inspiration. Uh, the guy is really a smart uh, connoisseur of our industry. So it was good to hear a different perspective. Oh, for sure. And to hear about that medieval cooking and that segue into that, that was wild. Like, could you imagine if he not got that first grant where all of this would end ended up for him like 30 bucks later and like a massive career all started with something like that hey eh? so yeah but that was the other thing that really sh stood out to me I, I was thinking in 1975 if i got a grant for eight thousand bucks to go to europe i would totally fuck that whole thing up <laughs> it sounds like he actually <laughs> yeah, exactly. went to libraries and researched and wrote and did the stuff he was supposed to do i'd be like man somebody just paid me seven grand to travel around europe and i would just screw the whole thing up so kudos to him that's why he is who he is and i am who i am exactly no i i, I definitely wanted to jump in there with the whole like ritual cooking of the vikings or something like that but then it would have just turned into heavy drinking and orgies anyway so I, I didn't even go there because, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a runaway train. But speaking of heavy drinking and orgies, I'm still in Texas. This is fantastic, right? I'm not getting any sleep. No. Right? So did you get some rest after San Antonio or what? Me? No. <laughs> I literally no. got, I, li I literally landed and my guests had arrived four hours before I landed. They got here at like nine in the morning. So that so I <laughs> went I went right from being fucking burned out from San Antonio and everything to immediate host and guest mode, which I don't mind. I haven't seen these people in a while, but you know, I mean, it's so yeah. And I know you haven't. You've been all over God's green earth. So it's nuts, man. It's absolutely nuts. Lafayette. The oh, whole. So we went to Pats of Henderson, just out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Yeah. Award-winning gumbo. Yeah. It's like an old plantation building and it was like like white collar. Yeah. Proper. It looked like the tablecloths and all that stuff. I was like, man, you all are oh. eating fancy. Good though. Oh man, stuffed spicy boudin balls. The deep fried crab claws, the whole like they had everything was just perfect, proper. The seafood gumbo came out almost black. The roux was right. so done. It was oh man. Hey, you have your uh, flannel oh. on. How did you get that back? So here's the thing. <laughs> it was not in the tent. Uh, Shannon and Tina stole it. So the whole time we were looking for your shirt, they knew that they had the shirt and they knew were, you were freaking they, out. They knew that they had the Yes. And they just didn't care that it was my only one until that morning when they're like, well, it's pretty cold. He probably needs his flannel. So then they left it at the, the front office. So they knew the whole time. So thanks, ladies. Well, this is this is ladies, you know? Sometimes they can be crafty, crafty little things. And this is, yeah, so I was freezing for a whole day and panicked because this is a limited edition. Yeah. If anybody I've out there learned knows Dixon's, and I know you do. I've learned more about flannels yeah, than I ever this, cared to know because of this incident with you. That's, I could put this thing on eBay right now. I'll probably get $250 for it because it's a limited edition, man. This is a, so I was heartbroken when I lost it, but thankfully they brought it back. So did you have fun in San Antonio? I did, you know. It's given did, me a lot to think about, you know what I mean? So now I'm 
yeah, I do. after San Antonio, I'm now I'm like, you know, I'm talking to Debbie. I'm like, well, how do I start drinking again? I don't want to just start drinking and pick up like I did before. I'll fuck myself up. So no. how do I do it? Do I like start with a beer? What do I do? I don't know what to do. So, yeah, I'm thinking through. I don't think you should start drinking. Let me digress. Let me go back to the beginning here. We were in San Antonio. And we were just giving her hard, man. We served, I don't know, 4,000 people in two days. We were cooking massive primals. If you didn't see, it was it was insane. Buddha and I, we banged it out. We, we have a magical team that we just, once we get going, we're like a steamroller. We knocked it out of the park. Everything was absolutely perfect. However, Mel was drinking all day and Buddha <laughs> wasn't. Yeah. And at the end of the day, Buddha was like, how come people, they gravitate more to you than me? I didn't say Because you're always that. having so much fun. I didn't say Well, that. however you need to say it. Well, what did you say? I forget what you said. How did you say <laughs> I it? I said Rob came up to me and said, hey, man, you seem really down. You don't seem like yourself. You're not the same person I'm used to being Listen. around. I said, what's up with that? Does everybody think that I'm like, you know, down or something? And Mel said. No, they think you're fucking sober. I mean, to be fair, well, I that's, was. That's the. I wasn't sober. <laughs> I just wasn't drinking. You fill in the blank. I'm just saying. At home. I'm, you know, and you know, it, this isn't for everybody. I get that. Ah, in a barbecue fueled atmosphere, yeah, it's, there is a 98th percentile that people have been drinking during the day. It's a. Well, it's not only drinking during the day. Especially the fun ones. It's the culture. Not all of them. That's right. Like, it's there's the, the hipsters that were across from. Yeah. And then, and then the other thing, though, that I didn't take into context and think about is how badly your body is beat up after standing on cement for 11 hours and cooking barbecue and slinging yes. it. Cause you're not thinking about it when you're doing it, you're just doing it. And no. so you're having a blast. Mel and I are entertaining everybody and Tina, Shannon. I mean, we had a really great team, this, this, uh, event and, uh, you're yep. on, but as soon as it's off, your body starts to remind you, especially at my tender old age, of how much pounding you did to it. And you don't, this is the first event that I've done since I have stopped drinking and my body really needed bourbon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what else to say. No. There's a reason no, no. why people consider bourbon a medicine and I found out in a very real way. So when everybody would meet downstairs to get like a pregame cocktail before going out to dinner, I was like, oh, I'm just think the one or, and though no offense to people that are sober or, or maintaining this path. It was a, a yeah. fork in the road or drunks for me. Whichever side of the fence you're on, it's yeah. a good side to be on. It's a good side to be on. Whatever. I'm either I'm either never going to do this stuff anymore and continue down the sober path, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is one option. Uh, so this could be a very short-lived a- podcasting <laughs> career for me. Uh, or you'll see Fat Buddha at the town next to nearest you. So <laughs> that was the thing also well, I couldn't get behind because I've lost... Since I've started doing this, I've lost about 35 pounds. Here's a funny story. So I went up to Mel and I was like, dude, I I had this really cool black big green egg hat that we got last year when we did the same ACE event, but it was in Vegas. And I was so fat at that time that that hat wouldn't fit, even on the last like notch. It just wouldn't fit. But I took the hat home because they gave it to me and I, I liked the hat. So I was hoping one day that maybe the hat would fit, though I didn't have high hopes for it. So I've lost about 35 pounds since trying on that hat before. So when I was packing to go, I was like, I'm going to try this hat again. And lo and behold, kids, when you lose weight, you lose weight in your head too. Your head gets smaller. I didn't know that. Now I know ah. it. So this hat, this hat fits. So I'm telling Mel the story, the exact story I'm telling all of you right now. And I'm telling Mel the story. Mel looks at me and he goes, no, it didn't. Your head's still big as shit. <laughs> He was like, you did not lose any girth or any size in your head. Your head is as big as it's ever been. You have a giant head. And I was like, well, thank you. And he said, in fact, now it's really disturbing because you have this skinny little body. You look like a fucking lollipop. You like the skinny little tiny body with this big giant head. I was like, okay, now I really have a lot to think about when I go back to the hotel room tonight. This now I'm now I'm depressed, late. sober, isolated <laughs> from the group, and now I look like a human lollipop. That isn't a good mental space for the barbecue Buddha to be in, ladies and gentlemen. Not at all. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been to his house, 
Whose His house? pillow is like a 2XL. My pillow? Yeah, I've been to your house. Yeah. And your pillow is like a 2XL. It's a big Poor pillow. Debbie's sleeping on like a like a tablecloth, and, and you got this 2XL pillow in there. You know why? Because you got a big fucking head. I That's need to why. know why you were in my bedroom looking at my pillows. I'm not surprised. I just, I just need I to like know. I like to watch people sleep. <laughs> Ask Jordan. Jordan was laughing. He was out. He was out by the pool, still drinking, while I was sneaking around your bedroom watching. Well, sleep. and, and I, I can't like wait to do time. this again because you guys are coming down for a full week before my book release party next month. And uh, this is one of my favorite yes, stories from when Mel was here the last time. So when you see Mel on his Instagram feed or all the multiple channels that you can find Mel on now, TV, obviously, whatever, fuck. He is just like he is. It's not an act. It's it, it may be an act, but he acts that way all the time, on and off air. So <laughs> I was out having coffee on our porch one morning, just sitting there having coffee, and I didn't know Mel was up. Well, Debbie gets up after me, and she must have gone in the kitchen with the dogs to feed the dogs. And Mel was in there in his bathrobe. Yes, the iconic bathrobe. He travels with his bathrobe. And... Uh, he was eating pickles out of the jar. He had the refrigerator open, was just standing there in front of the open refrigerator, eating pickles and drinking pickle juice out of this jar, which, you know, again, you know, some people may find that interesting, some people, whatever, it's, it gets a reaction, okay? But that's what Mel does. He, he does that in the morning. That's his morning routine. Well, Debbie didn't blink an eye. She didn't ask him about it. She didn't say anything about it. She just observed it, went about her business, fed the dogs. And when she came out to join me on the porch, she looked at me and said, did you know that Mel's drinking pickle juice? And I said, yeah, I did. That's what he does. And that's just the way it's going to be. This, so, and this is a true story. Like, you've seen it on my stories. It, it is what it is. But same deal here. We pull up to the Pampas camp, right? Mm -hmm. We've got our live fire camp out here, right on the Guadalupe River. The first thing we do, mm -hmm. run to the general store, right. three jars of pickles, right away. You need and it. That's, and everyone's staring at me like, why do you need three jars of pickles? That's going to last you a month. I'm like, I will be done these in two days. Oh, this easy. And the pickle jar I yep. got for Mel, it should go without saying. It was like one of those big 32-ounce... <laughs> It was like a pumpkin. Yeah. It was like a barrel of like the big yeah. pickles and the pickle juice. That was gone. I, I I think we had to get more pickles while you we were here. I mean that yeah. that normal people, not to say you're not normal, but I mean t normal pickle eating people probably would never buy a jar that size unless they were having a party yeah. or some event. And if they yeah. did, it would last them a year, two years. That was gone in two days. Mel likes a pickle. Well, here here is my uh, John Candy life hack of the day is right. when you drink your face off from 7 a.m. until 3 a.m., the next morning's going to suck. Yeah. Unless you drink pickle juice. If you drink pickle juice before you go to bed and then again when you wake up, you probably won't even feel what you did to your body. So and that's the secret. Again. So Pedialyte, all this other stuff that people drink to, to sort of game the pickle system, juice. F that, pickle juice. Pick, pickles and pickle juice. Right before bed, Drink half a jar. In the morning, drink the other half. And, and how did you, you learn this? Where did abuse... you get this? Is this a Ukrainian thing? Is this oh, like it's a, a Ukrainian where, where... thing? It's a Ukrainian thing. I knew about the miracles of pickle juice before I was even a heavy drinker. So up until like twelve, I would eat pickles pre pre gaming. For, and it doesn't give you what, a sour stomach. I mean, I would think with the pickle juice and the booze, oh, buddy, it, and the, probably the, the tacos other magic and trick. Stuff. Yeah, okay. The other magic trick to being Ukrainian is that you can eat. A half a jar or a half a, a pail of sour cream, and then pile pickle juice on top of that. Okay. And then drink a half a bottle of vodka before you go to bed, and nothing curdles. I don't know why. Anybody else are like that would curdle for sure, but for some reason Ukrainians are able to. I don't know. Do you think is there a stuff. possibility? I'm just asking this because everybody's thinking it that it is yes. indeed curdling, but you have so much activity going. <laughs> inside of you with other stuff that you do to yourself that that curdling is just like a part of the landscape or part of the tapestry of what's going on inside this Mel's body like a normal person like me not that I'm normal but that curdling would be oppressive and upfront, and it yes. would be like everything my mind would think about but for you it's just part of the symphony it's like the bassoon and the curdling That's... is just one of the instruments of the songscape that's going on inside your body 
And this is why I told you I never take painkillers anytime <laughs> I hurt myself or whatever. Okay. Because I feel like I might live with a fairly high amount of pain every day. Right. And I just don't know it. So if I ever have a day when I don't feel it, I'm, I'm afraid that most of my days will suck after that. Yeah, so, I'm telling you. How old are you? You know, I was trying to figure this out the other day, and you don't have to 41. Say it. You're 41. 41 years old. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're a young whippersnapper. But let me tell you, 40 is the age where everybody starts to say, oh, you're 40 now. That's when things start to fall apart. And it sounds like what you say to everybody, but it is. It is when things yep. start to fall apart. And as each year goes by, they fall apart at more of a rapid pace. So much so that what we've just described about what's going on in your body is going on with me in other ways, like sore legs, feet, knees, ankles, backs. I mean, it's it just progressively gets worse. So learning to live with pain is just a part of what you have to do now going yep. forward, young man. Nope, I hear you. And I'm excited about it. Thank you, White Claws. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This is another episode of Africa Cook with me, Chris Sussman, otherwise known as Barbecue Buddha, and this guy over here. That's me, Dark Side of the Grill, Mel Schmiller. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Make sure you hit the buzzer, hit the bell, hit the comments, let us know how we did, and make sure you subscribe to us across all platforms wherever you hear your podcasts.